Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the University of St. Joseph and the Women's Leadership Center, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Global Change Makers. We are honored to host Ambassador Roya Rami, former ambassador of Afghanistan to the United States, a true champion of global women's rights. Tonight's event is in part of an ongoing collaboration between the World Affairs Council of Connecticut and the Women's Leadership Center here at the University of St. Joseph. The University of St. Joseph is a comprehensive small private college with both undergraduate and graduate degree programs. After 80 plus years as an undergraduate women's college, USJ became fully co-educational in 2018. The university maintains a focus on women and supporting women via the Women's Leadership Center, which was founded in 2016, and we are committed to developing inspiring and effective leaders. The WLC provides leadership programming and professional development via free workshops, trainings, courses, and forums. As I said tonight, we're very proud to be partnering with the World Affairs Council. Each year, we join forces to recognize International Women's Day and highlight women who are making an impact in our world. And I would like to now introduce you to Megan Torrey, the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, another global change maker. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we are so pleased to be here for another International Women's Day program, uh, especially in 2024, because the World Affairs Council of Connecticut is celebrating 100 years this year of impacting our community. What I'm particularly proud of is our in-office staff, our executive staff, for over 100 years has been primarily women. So I stand here in the shoes of Betty Knapp and Betsy Hall, did I get that right? Betsy Hall, Marjorie Anderson, and Felicity Harley, who came before me, who have all made an impact on all of our communities and making it better, um, including one of the things that they did in 1952 was start our Model United Nations program at Hartford High School. For over 72 years, we've been educating our young, uh, our young global leaders. And I'm so happy tonight to have with us four of our young students to come and introduce the ambassador. Uh, you'll see that the future is in good hands with these young women. So I want to introduce Sadia and Sadaf and Maria Hashimi and Oranus Habibi. Welcome, ladies. خلقت زن بر نیکوکاری بود، زندگانیش فداکاری بود. مادری و مهربانی های او، رنج ها و جانفشانی های او، هر یکی از دیگر بالاتر است، آنچه خورشید است، آنگر اختر است. The creation of woman was based on virtue. Her life is a sacrifice. Motherhood and her kindness. Her suffering and sacrifices, each one is higher than the other. She's like the sun, she's like the star. Good evening, my name is Sadia Hoshimi. I'm currently a senior at Harfa Public High School. I'm here um, as a member of Model United Nation. I would like to take a moment to wish Happy Women's Day to all the beautiful and strong women in the auditorium and around the world. Today is a special day to celebrate the achievements and the contribution of women in various fields, as well as the, to raise awareness about the ongoing struggle for gender equality. I am deeply honored to be invited here on this special occasion of Women's Day to introduce you to one of the most courageous women, Ms. Roya Rahmani, the former ambassador of Afghanistan to United States. Ms. Roya Rahmani, 
has played a critical role in the relationship between Afghanistan and the United States. She's, <clears throat> sorry. Ms. Rara Humani is a true inspir an inspiration and a role model for me and so many Afghan girls and women. Her courage, resilience, and dedication to promoting peace and empowerment of women, and she served as a shining example for all of us and her determination and has inspired me and all Afghan girls for justice and equality. As an Afghan girl that I moved here recently, <clears throat> I was born in Afghanistan and I spent two years there after a Taliban takeover. I would like to share my experience in the challenges that I faced um, for accessing education. I went through numerous um, challenges when the Taliban took over Afghanistan and banned girls from attending school. I missed years of school just like many other girls in Afghan women who faced and continue to face the same challenges. During the Taliban regime, I experienced a deep depression as school was banned and I had to leave my homeland, home, friend, and everything behind. Moving to a different country is a challenging decision, especially for someone who has spent their entire life in one place. I, ha I had to adopt to a new culture, new lifestyle, which was not easy. However, I know that I had to prioritize my education and there was no opportunity better than moving to the United States. And <clears throat> I believe that education is a critical for every individual regardless of, regardless of their gender or background. But unfortunately, many Afghan girls face uh, significant barriers when it comes to accessing education and <clears throat> um, and I hope the opportunity that I have and I come to United States I wish the other Afghan girls um, have this has the same opportunity that I have and let's stand with Afghan girls and support them for the education and indeed they have the same right in equality as other any children in world. And I want to say every woman's success should be an inspiration to another. <clears throat> as we celebrate Women's Day, let us honor Ms. Rora Rahmani's legacy and continue to support women in their quest for equality and justice. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sadaf Hashimi from Afghanistan. I'm currently a junior at Hartford Public High School and a member of Model United Nations with World Affairs Council. I'm truly honored to be here today and to be part of this group. As we gather for this special occasion, I would like to wish each incredible woman in here a happy International Women's Day. It is a day to celebrate the remarkable achievements and contributions of women around the world. Today I am here to introduce you to a brave woman, an Afghan diplomat who served as Afghanistan's first female ambassador to United States, Roya Rahmani. Ms. Roya Rahmani is chair of Delphus International, where she plays a pivotal role uh, in expanding the firm's business networks, enhancing its global reach, and amplifying its impact. She is a role model for me and all Afghan girls and women, and I admire her confidence, strength, and courage that no matter how and how much problem was there, she never gave up and she tried hard to reach in this position to find the success. And that is why I get inspired to get involved with Model United Nations Club. As I get this chance to speak about Women's Day and their rights, I want to mention the women's rights in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the only country in the world that bans girls and women's access to education. And after 30 years, Afghanistan is the worst country to be a woman. As, I, as research shows that currently there is just 4% of women uh, working and 20% of girls attending school. 
This is not how girls and women should be treated. This is not humanity. I implore the world to stand in solidarity with Afghan girls amid its challenges. Afghan girls are resilient and aspiring for education, uh, equality, and a brighter future. Let's collectively raise our voices, demand attention, and advocate for the rights of Afghan girls and women. Please stand with us in this fight. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. My name is Maria Habibi from Afghanistan. I'm a sophomore uh, at Hartford Public High School and a member of the Model UN. I'm honored to be able to talk about Ambassador Roya Rahmani, who serves as a senior advisor with the South Asia practice at the Alternate Council and the senior fellow for international security at the New America Foundation. She is a she is an inspiration not only to me, but to all Afghani girls and the women. I stand here because of her and I am able to speak here today. She is a strong, independent woman who has uh, paved the way and has given a voice to me and many more girls like me. She has uh, inspired to me to never give up on my dreams and to try hard as can I can to achieve them. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Urano Sashemi from Afghanistan. I'm freshman in Hartford High School, and I'm a member of Model United Nations and World Affairs Councils. I'm very excited to stand here in front of everyone and talk about our Afghan superstar, Roya Rahmani, Ambassador Rio Rahmani is our inspiration. She is our voice. She is our hope, not only for me, my sisters, but for all Afghani little girls that dream for a better future. I'm lucky to be in this country where I can continue to go to school and dream for a better future for myself. I'm able to be a voice for Afghani girls and women. There's no limit to what we as women can accomplish. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are so honored to have you here with us tonight. Is this working? You flip the switch. There we go. Although I've never been accused of uh, having a soft voice. Uh, so we have tried to get Ambassador Rahmani here to the World Affairs Council of Connecticut for five years. And I think tonight is a very auspicious night because we had our students with us and, you're, uh, and rain brings good luck. And so this is, this is very much good luck. So w welcome. Thank you so much. And I think it is even more special because today, it, this year is your 100th anniversary. So congratulations. Thank you. I think it's a, I, I, I sometimes feel like I've been here for all 100 years, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, just so proud to stand in the shoes of such amazing women who paved the way, the way for me, um, which is what you do for so, so many. Uh, we have a lot of students in the room tonight and a lot of students, uh, uh, particularly from the University of Connecticut, watching the stream here tonight. And I thought I would open by asking you to tell us a little bit about your journey. Um, and how you got here? Uh, well, first of all, uh, salam alaikum and a very warm good evening to everybody here. Uh, before I start talking about my journey, um, I would like to say that you already met the people who keeps me going, who give, gives me hope. Sadia, Sadaf, Oronus, and Mehriya who came here and spoke 
is the reason that we all keep going. So thank you. Thank you for all you do. And thank you for your talent. You are an inspiration by yourself. And thank you so much, Ms. Tori and Ms. Collins, uh, for the kind introduction and the invitation here. Um, I am charged guilty for not being able to be here before, but I think um, it was just meant to be um, this year. And I am so humbled to be sitting here with you in your 100th anniversary. What got me here is basically the story that probably many of the, the Afghan women, Afghan girls share um, the same thing. Uh, it has been, it's a story of resistance, of limitation, of fighting, and having fun along the way, I would say. It doesn't feel like having fun all, all, at the time that it's happening, but looking back, I would say it, it has been. So I uh, was born in Kabul, um, and almost, I usually see, say the eve of the Sour Revolution, which was when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, uh, right a year before that. And um, since then, the journey has been um, uh, interesting, to say the least, because it has been marked by one conflict after another one, and we had to adjust ourselves accordingly. So I was born uh, in an urban family, uh, the first child. And um, I have uh, four siblings uh, where I started practicing, um, I call it leadership, they call it bossiness. Uh, I enjoyed it, they didn't so much. Um, so that's, that's how it all started. And uh, uh, I was a teenager uh, when we were, uh, we didn't left, we were forced to leave. Uh, I have left uh, through war. Uh, I, we, my family left uh, for, pa for neighboring country Pakistan. Uh, like many other Afghans took the same journey. Uh, we have seen it in and out, everything from what is it to live in, a, in war, in conflict, first-hand experiences of it. Um, my biggest wish growing up as a child was to go to school because school was not always an option. There was continuously war and the schools would close down uh, on and off. When I, uh, it was my first year of high school when we were forced to leave the country. So the, the pair of clothes that I had chosen for the first day of my high school never got to be worn. Um, so, um, uh, in my education, usually they say, uh, what did you do? And like, I started, I, I, I leave some of it out because it gets a bit too daunting. And so I, I um, uh, studied in Afghanistan, then I studied in Pakistan. In fact, I was enrolled in a, in a madrasa, which is a very religious school in Pakistan. Uh, because that was the only option that was available. And I was very happy to have that option. That was like the biggest uh, blessing at the time. Not because that was the standard or anything that me or my family wanted, but that was the only option. So, um, and then um, I had the opportunity to travel to Canada. That, at that time, there. It was a rarity, not many women did that. It was a very hard decision for my family. Um, and it was my first night out of my home, leaving my family, uh, not to go to uncle's house, but to go to Canada, a country that nobody in my family had ever been. I had no relatives. I didn't know where I'm going, but I, I knew I was enrolled at McGill University. This is where I started. I started studying uh, in software engineering. I have a degree in computer science, so I started with, in private sector. Um, and then um, I went on after my graduation. There was the possibility to go back to Afghanistan and contribute to the change, and I couldn't resist that. I scraped my life in Canada in three days, and I decided to go back for six months. I stayed there for another three, four years. And then when I was 
thinking that there is no way that I can contribute and make a difference. I came back, I did another degree at Columbia um, in New York, Columbia University. Um, so if there are SIPA alumni, hello. <laughs> um, um, and uh, uh, then uh, I went in terms of my career from private sector, from technical to nonprofit. I did that for a decade. Then uh, I was, I, again, I did it in Afghanistan and in many other countries, but then I thought uh, in Afghanistan in particular, the biggest issue was working with government and it was a problem. So instead of sitting on the other side and complaining about it, why not go into it and try to change something? So um, I entered the Afghan government, the system. I was there for a decade. I was in foreign service. Um, and uh, I, my first posting was as ambassador to Indonesia and then Singapore and United States. I was also non-resident for a couple of Latin American countries. And now, full circle back, I am back in private sector, but nevertheless, I continue to do what I can and uh, be with people like yourself as much as I can when I have the opportunity and privilege to be. So thank you for being here. It certainly is a privilege to have you with us tonight. So let's pivot a little bit to Afghanistan and let's uh, sort of baseline where we are today. Um, not just for women and girls, and we'll get to that in the next question, but what's the situation on the ground as we sit here now? Um, well, I, I think a lot of uh, you who are present here have an idea of what is happening. And I am not going to start by recounting how miserable things are. If the question is whether things that you hear is as bad as it is, uh, the response is yes. So it's a country that's totally isolated. It's the country that has, is not recognized by any other country in the world. So what does that mean? It means total economic isolation. Other than export, uh, sorry, importing, basic commodities and some uh, very um, specific goods, there is nothing else happening. There is some, rela uh, some trade relationship between the neighboring countries, but it is at the very basic level. In terms of political stability, it's a country that, is, that again, is not recognized. So we don't actually have a real embassy anywhere. Of course, some of our embassies are functional, trying to help our um, Afghan citizens and trying to provide them with the services they can, but the, the government is not recognized. Um, but the darkest, the worst part is, the more than 50% of the population is just simply sent to prison. And that's the women of Afghanistan. So, whom used to work, who used to go to the gyms, who were part of the vibrant media, sports, music, arts, uh, education, you name it, uh, business, everything. And now they are simply sent home. So the situation is uh, bad, it is dire for the Afghan people. The number one complaint they have is the dysfunctional economy or the lack of Af an economy altogether. Um, of course, security uh, has not improved. Uh, I mean, uh, the war in a, in a as, as they say, the war is over. Yes, it is over because the, 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 the group that was on suing war is now in power. So there is groups here and there that, that are uh, trying and attempting some security incidences. But is 
the definition of peace, living in fear, living in limitation, living in prison for women, if that is peace, that is not what we have achieved. So war may be over, but peace is not there. So I, you dedicate a lot of your time um, to economic empowerment. Uh, and I know last week you were with Secretary Blinken talking about um, how we can address uh, Afghan uh, economic empowerment for Afghan women. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of those initiatives and how you're reaching women in Afghanistan? Um, two things. Uh, as you said, uh, at this point, I have uh, come to the stage that I would like to dedicate as much time as I can uh, or all the focus I have to economic empowerment. And there is a reason. The reason is if you're working for uh, gender parity in different sectors, the sector that is lagging behind the most is economic parity. According to the uh, World Economic Forum, year after year, when they are looking at the indexes, when they are reviewing and uh, assessing countries and their uh, uh, progress towards gender parity, education is slowly getting there. It's still not there, which is, of course, a shame. Political takes over 100 years. But when it comes to economics, it's still assessed to be over 200 years for economic parity to be reached. And this is a major problem. It's at the core of a lot of the inequalities that we are facing all around the world. The fact that we are talking about it is even embarrassing, but let alone waiting for it for over another 200 years. So um, I, as, as I have been growing up, one of my biggest uh, values uh, has been to deliver and also to be very focused on results. So as, as a result of that, now um, I do focus a lot on economic empowerment. As you mentioned, we, um, as, as part of my work at Davos, we have been partnering uh, a lot uh, with initiatives that are related to economic empowerment. And um, at the, the event that you mentioned last week uh, with Secretary Blinken, uh, which uh, was uh, really uh, refreshing because it was not really about getting together and singing the song of how miserable Afghan women are living under the current regime, but what we can actually do and what are the initiatives and what are the options and opportunities, and we were debating and discussing that. Um, so uh, there, there are opportunities. I think that it's, it's always about the will I, I am a believer that the, when there is a will, there is a way. And we need to just invest in finding that path and way that would help us. Is it easy? Not at all. Is it possible? Absolutely. There are ways uh, to pursue and find a way to help Afghan women. And I find that economic empowerment of women around the globe but particularly also for women in Afghanistan is key. So there is a lot of different options and opportunities to uh, try to um, cling on and find ways to help them. So I just want to put a plug in, so get your questions in now. The team is walking around with some question cards. And at home, you have instructions on how to email your questions in. And uh, we really do like to make this a participatory conversation. But let's go back to education, um, since you mentioned it's absolutely a key. And uh, we know that our young students, if they were still living in Afghanistan, wouldn't have the opportunity to go to school right now. Um, but are there? innovations or ways that, um, that those young women are able to access education, maybe through um, internet initiatives or in other ways? Um, well, as you said, you, you, you want to plug in, and I want to plug in that, first of all, it is, it's a shame that we, at this time and age, we are putting up with the situation 
in a country that does not allow girls beyond the sixth grade to go to school. Like just the mere fact of that is just embarrassing. I think I don't know how we have come to the point to agree, uh, no, not agree, to accept, to, to, to let it be. That's, and I don't think any of the initiatives, frankly speaking, would really fully be a 100% alternative for what they are missing. Because from my childhood, from my background, I know that the, uh, the direction on the reverse way to indoctrinate people to become radicalized, to become extremists, to, to believe in things, to not question, to, to let go of critical thinking, is happening and it's happening fast. And it's so hard to reverse once it is internalized. Now, uh, the, given the situation and what's happening, are there initiatives? Yes, there are many initiatives. Many organizations are trying to do what they can, uh, from homeschooling to providing uh, material to um, devising courses online to giving access to courses online. But there is a lot of limitations. In fact, as, as the speakers earlier, um, the students, the uh, UN model students were mentioning, um, it's, it's just a huge struggle all along. If, if, you have, uh, if, if, if you are accessing education online, do you have internet access? If you have internet, uh, if you, uh, do you have even a computer that's functioning? Do you even have an, uh, electricity to charge it and, and be able to plug in? So the, it, there is, there's multiple uh, problems, but nevertheless, when the need is so great, anything, anything that is possible that, that we can reach them with is helpful. And um, in the event that you earlier mentioned, I was very pleased to hear from um, some um, of the bigger organizations, um, tech uh, companies, about uh, how they have opened up and that they are trying to reach as many girls as possible. And knowing the, the quest and the resilience of the girls back in Afghanistan, I'm, I'm sure they will make the most and the best out of it. So to back up a little bit, uh, I sort of want to ask you if getting to this point was avoidable or inevitable. Because uh, if we all recall, back during the prior administration, uh, the administration in Ambassador Khalilazad uh, engaged in direct talks with the Taliban leaving the official Afghani government um, out of the picture. And you were a big critic of that. Um, did that lead to where we are today? How did we get here? Yes, partly, at least partly, for sure. Because um, in a negotiation, you have to treat the other side somewhat of an equal. In this context, uh, there was one side that was basically already with all cards up saying, we are leaving, we are done, how do we wrap this up? And the other side wanting it all. And that in the absence of the government that was incumbent, despite the difficulties, despite whatever it was, but that was the result of the very nascent democracy that was there. Was right or wrong, but that was the one that was voted in. That the, the, there was a lot of issues, there was a lot of problems, but that was what it was. And then leaving, as a result, the entire country out and negotiating the fate of the country with the group that was living in the margins and was trying to take over and change the entire country the way that they want to live, the mindset that they have, and doing it like by imposition is, of course, resulted to what we are having today. 
a lot of this was going on while you were ambassador. I mean, were they consulting you? Were they, you know, engaging you and your team at all? Uh, who? <laughs> the the prior the prior administration. Uh, the Afghan administration. No, no. Okay. So the prior oh, U.S. administration. Um, the the which U.S. Was, administration. You know, sort of, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you said it before. The Afghan government was left out. Mm. The 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 talks started. Even when it started at the very outset, the Afghan government was not even aware that it's starting. Mm. So that was, uh, that's how it started. Then um, as it went on, there was briefings happening. Um, uh, but of course there was, the, the issue was way bigger than that, to be honest. It was, it, it was the entire situation. It was not about the consultation. It was not about how we talked and when we talked. It was really that the policy has shifted and the U.S. had decided that they are going to withdraw. And the courts were up. They, they had already shown the other side what they, 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 are, they are giving them what they have been waiting for. And they have waited a, a, a United States out. So they... The modality of how it happened and how it could have been different is, is a much more complex uh, situation that I don't think we have the patience <laughs> here. So, so let's pivot a little bit to talk about your current role, and I'm going to ask our team to get their questions ready because I see a lot, and I want to make sure we get to some. Um, the role you have now at Delphos is a global one. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, how that's working, uh, the things that you're doing to for economic empowerment all over the globe and, and, and in, you know, particularly in Africa right now? Um, at Davos, uh, we are a financial advisory firm. What we do is trying to help uh, countries uh, in emerging markets and frontier markets access capital because they, they, one of the major obstacles as I am traveling around the world, as I am talking to different groups, to, the, uh, to people in private sector, to governments, to the um, um, uh, nonprofit sector, all of them, one way or another, leading to one issue, access to finances. There is not lack of great ideas. There is not lack of knowing what they have to do to help their own situation. The, usually the problem is where do you get the capital? Where do you get the finances? And that's the role that we play at Delphos. Uh, we help our clients around the world access finance. And with, with what I have seen and, and the, the values that I have, I want to also uh, always encourage clients to think about not, not from a nicety or ethical perspective, but from a very, from business perspective, bringing business sense to the fact that women need to be incorporated. It is just the right practice. It's for sustainability of business. It's a profitable um, uh, approach to adopt. And how we make sure that we do that all along and, and, and addressing the gap that I mentioned before. Like how at the pace that we are going another two, uh, over 200 years waiting out for women to find economic parity, I think that's, that's totally unacceptable. That's why we, need, we, every, we don't need just one day. And we don't need just International Women's Day, right? We need, we need this every day. Um, so I'm going to throw it to audience questions. And I have the first one that was emailed m to me from Jim in Santa Fe, from the World Affairs Council in Santa Fe. Um, you said it before, sort of, uh, no country has recognized the Taliban. And, and with their takeover in 2021, so much foreign assistance, humanitarian and foreign assistance has stopped. Um, Jim wants to know, given, uh, given that, what's the most effective means uh, to get humanitarian and foreign, citizen, uh, foreign assistance provided to the citizens of Afghanistan? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Jim, for the question. And thank you for paying attention, because uh, since 
multiple crises uh, have emerged and unraveled in the world, the, the bandwidth and attention to Afghanistan has uh, uh, really shrunk and uh, it has, uh, the, the, the interest has really waned down. So thank you for your interest. Uh, what is what is the uh, best way of uh, supporting uh, people in Afghanistan? Uh, of course, with the humanitarian assistance, there is multiple ways. Uh, a lot of the uh, multilaterals are working very hard. They have been uh, on the ground. A lot of uh, NGOs are uh, still functioning. Uh, there is bilateral assistance that is going through the countries that, that, is, that is helping. Mm, and, and there has been many modalities of that, uh, which all of them have been helpful because the need is so great. It's a, it's, it's a relatively big country and then there is, the need is so great. But what I usually advocate for is that humanitarian aid is like an emergency room. It is important. It's like an IV for a patient. It keeps it alive, but it doesn't cure it. So to cure, uh, the patient to, to change the situation, it needs to be, uh, the efforts need to be geared toward more sustainable approaches. And I have come to the point that there is nothing but economic empowerment of the people of Afghanistan. And there are ways to do it. There are ways to do it because this way you will reorient the dependency of peop uh, from people to maybe the regimes. You empower people. You let them get over trying to uh, bring the bread and butter to the table or make it or not, and really be able to think beyond that. That is the way out, and that is the most important way that I have, in my view, I have been advocating, and many others have been advocating, and we really hope that we will find a way to work and support Afghan people, not giving them handouts, but a hand out to help them and help them uh, help with the economic empowerment. Throw it over to you. All right, so I'm gonna come, I'm gonna present uh, two audience questions that are kind of along the same lines. So we have one from Lucy. Um, it has become very difficult for Afghan university women to obtain a, st obtain a student visa um, in the U.S. How can we make that process more workable for them? And from Martha, are girls and women and families at risk for punishment for pursuing alternative forms of education in Afghanistan? And what can we do here to help them? Did you get um. The, the first question regarding the visas, I think, I think the fact that you're speaking up is the first step. And, and I am a believer, when, when you take the first step, then, then that's, 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 you have started the journey, basically. So I don't have a solution for you. I can't say that you can go and um, talk to this person or that organization, or there is this way to handle uh, the situation. In fact, I am getting, on daily basis, numerous calls and messages from people who really need help inside the country, outside the country, in the, in the, in the third countries who are trying to get out. And I don't have a solution. And I would love to know how, how we can help them. But um, the fact that you are speaking up, I think universities, again, um, you can just my uh, suggestion would be join forces. I'm sure if you have this problem, many other universities, colleges have the same problem. There, there are students that they would like to sponsor, they would like to bring over. So join forces, talk to your um, members, uh, representatives in Congress, and address the issue. Um, the second question about whether families uh, are um, going to be punished for uh, girls seeking alternative education. Let me first start and say that, uh, as I mentioned before, Afghanistan is not in peace. So that it's not only uh, because of some of the factors that I uh, counted in terms of the limitations and uh, policing and all that, but it's also that people do not feel secure. People always feel that, that they have been watched. They, um, you, you probably have seen uh, articles in the, in the media, and not a lot of them are uh, 
out there anymore, but uh, of how the women who protested were imprisoned, who were tortured, the people who have spoken against uh, the, the regime, or those who just simply worked with the previous regime have been tortured and um, um, arrested. Uh, so uh, yes, this is a concern. But I can tell you, uh, it has been like in the previous version of Taliban and even now, Afghan people by default are not uh, extremists or not uh, people who uh, are against education, who are against civilization. In fact, they embrace it. They, they, or, uh, they do everything. And, and they did it even during the past 20 years when there was an active conflict happening in a lot of places. They would take the risk for education and still they do. Uh, there might be, some might not be in any kind of danger for uh, trying to find alternative ways to educate their girls, but some are. But I can tell you one thing, that never, never I have seen one instance that that would intimidate them and convince them not to do it. Next question. Okay, this is from Amanda. Um, thank you for being here, Ambassador Romani. Can you share your outlook for women's education in Afghanistan 10 years from now? And what do you think are the most effective actions a global community could take to support them? When I started, I said that um, I lived in war. One of the things that it teaches you is that um, you can't really predict or plan for 10 years ahead. It's a novelty nowadays that I am thinking, okay, after six months, maybe we will go somewhere, and then there is the holidays at this time, and I don't know, my daughter is out of school at that, uh, like six months from now. This, this is not natural. This is different, because when you are living in, in a situation of war and conflict and constant uncertainty, you have to be adaptable and you have to move with things. So my outlook in general, to be honest, is that we, we have to adapt and I'm just hoping every single day that things would be better for the Afghan women than it has been uh, uh, over the past, over, over two years now. So. Um, with that, uh, there is two things. There is one big concern I have, and that is the one that I already mentioned, the uh, indoctrination. If people start to believe this is the way, and people, I'm not talking about a switch going on and off and thinking, okay, now modernity is good, now it's better to be more conservative or this and that. But I am the new generation, Afghanistan is a very young country, a lot of kids are there. If they see this as the way of life, if they see that their sisters by the seventh grade are no longer allowed to go to school as the way of life, this phenomena by itself, the girls accepting that eventually, this is a dangerous one. And it's not only for, for Afghanistan, of course it's terrible, it's devastating, but it's, it's, it's bad for the region and globally. So, uh, I'm, on the other hand, I'm hopeful with, that with the technological advancements, maybe we would be able to leapfrog Last time we were able to leapfrog the five years of Taliban's rule, and the women caught up. Women did way better than anybody expected them. The ones that were out of colleges, schools, workspace, all, they all, it wasn't easy. I saw it firsthand, but they caught up. And I'm hoping that this period of imprisonment will end sooner than that, that they will catch up. And with the technological advancement, this would be faster. Because I, I hope and I dream that with the generative uh, AI, we would be able to make the systems that we never had. Maybe we can totally leapfrog it, and then we will have it. And that is, that's what keeps us hopeful. 
Okay, we have one more right now from Jonah. Um, as time passes from the U.S. withdrawal, we may be liable to forget about the plight of Afghan women and the crisis. How do we ensure that the world does not forget? Through what you are doing now. Mm -hmm. You are here, you are asking a question, you are, you are remembering them. That's the way, that's the only way. That's, that, that's how it starts and that's the only way to go forward. Any other audience questions? So, um, any? So let's talk about where do we go from here, what you did. Um, it, as you said, it's impossible to predict. But if the international community is looking at Afghanistan and how we move forward and what some of the possibilities are, um, how do we, wh what do we do? Wh where do we go from here? Well, I will repeat something that I, I have said it before. I think, first of all, for the international community to do something meaningful and not repeat some of the mistakes is to change their mindset and outlook toward Afghanistan. Looking at Afghanistan either as a security concern or a charity basket is where that is what has gotten us to the point that we are today. If we can look beyond it, beyond Af Afghanistan, beyond being a security concern, a place that extremism could grow and it could be bad, or maybe uh, you could test and try things, and then there is new policies and even development uh, approaches and this and that. And, and then a place that, that needs humanitarian aid and you keep it, because all of that, if it is prolonged, it is very harmful. If we look beyond that, if we change our outlook from that scenario, there is a way to do things differently. And again, Afghanistan sits not in any single region, but in between three regions. It has the potential to really grow and uh, become a crossroad as it was in the, uh, in historically for goods, commodities, energy, civilizations, and whatnot. So with all of, uh, to capitalize on that opportunity, to look at it from a different interest base would be the way forward for the international community. And that would be also a way to sustainably empower the very people who want nothing by, but that, um, to get off and decide their fate by their own instead of a group from here or there coming and imposing certain values on them. So um, that, that would be the way forward, and I think there is a way, and I hope that we get to that point sooner than later. I think we all hope that, absolutely. Do we have another audience question? Uh, we have a question from Pinal, and it's regarding uh, the role that informal sources of support and funding have played in the recovery of Afghanistan. Um, so what informal support such as crowdfunding or possibly even uh, cryptocurrencies have played a role uh, in the rebuilding of Afghanistan? I am assuming it's post-2021. Um, I don't know much about the cryptocurrencies role uh, playing uh, in Afghanistan. I know it was popular prior to that. Uh, but um, the informal um, support that has been organized by different groups and individuals and organizations have been helpful. It, it, the way I see it, the, uh, it comes from direct and firsthand experience. If I had the opportunity to buy books, I read books. If I had the opportunity to pay for a class, I went to class. If, we had the opportunity to buy fuel and put a generator power and have power, we had power. It's as simple as that. 
supporting one person, one life, is support for that family and that for community and, and the surrounding that they live. Of course, at the higher level, I always advocate for scale. But every single job counts. Every person is one, not, not uh, only one individual life, but, but this, this person's life and all those who are surrounding uh, her or him. So I think we're almost out of time, and I'm going to uh, ask you a, a final question. I do want to point out that some of our friends from IRIS are in the audience tonight, so our, so our refugee resettlement organization. And I know that so many of you in the audience want to help. Um, and they have ways that you can help, help um, resettle and welcome uh, those in our community that are like our young students that are here today. And so I urge you to, to get in touch with them if you want to make a difference here on the ground. Um, so as we wrap up Ambassador Rachmani, I want to give you the opportunity to close with whatever maybe you didn't say or something you want to get out or um, what your best hope for the future is. Uh, what do you, um, what do you want to see? What do you envision the most? Um, well, for Afghanistan, first of all, I would like to say that I am really grateful for your attention, uh, for your presence, uh, for your interest uh, and the sustainment of your interest on the issue and remembering and uh, what uh, can be done. Uh, the, uh, there is always a solution here and there around the corner if we are persistent and we have, if we keep looking for it. So uh, let's not be discouraged, not dis discount. If the effort is small or big, it matters. Anything that we can do for people in Afghanistan, it does matter. It, and the need is immense, and it's very well received. Secondly, you mentioned that so many Afghans um, uh, came to the United States. Uh, they have been uh, going through the resettlement uh, process. It's never an easy process. Imagining that you scrap everything that you knew. It's not only the physical stuff that you had, the home, the car, the belongings, the this, the that, but it's your roots. It's the grandfather's graveyard. It is that cultural thing. It's the place that you went to school. It's that childhood friend. You lose it all when you go and start over. So let's remember that that all these people who have come here, in the next generations, their kids, your kids, are neighbors. They, they play together, they are colleagues, they, 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 are, they are your neighbors now, but, but they, they, they wouldn't be looking at them as refugees. So how do you want those kids to remember what their experiences, their parents' experiences and stories have been? And, and basically superimpose it to that of yours. So that's the best way to help because they have already gone through a lot. And, um, but just generally, as we are marking the International Women's Day, you said it before, and I just want to repeat what you said, that it shouldn't be a day of continuously recounting the challenges and how long is it still uh, to walk this mile and uh, what is still left and all that. Let's work together to make the real change and make it a celebration that this would be a memory, this would be a place for all of us to celebrate and enjoy and be equal. Uh, and lastly, I have nothing to say but an expression of gratitude, again, for your attention. And this is the way, the taking the time uh, from your busy lives, coming here this evening um, to uh, have this discussion is all it takes. I'm sure that uh, when I was trying to find my Uber and my way and this and that, you had some good opportunities to meet one another and mingle, uh, which was totally my loss. And, uh, 
uh, I hope that these continue. This, this is what life is made of, right? So thanks again for being here. Absolutely. Transformational change. Transformational change takes leadership. And you are certainly an inspiring leader that is creating that global change that we need. And so I hope all of you are as inspired as, as I am to have Ambassador Rachmani with us tonight. Thank you so much, Ms. Tori. Thank you.